I don't need to keep the Sabbath. That was the Old Testament, and we are in the New Testament now. Jesus argued with all the Pharisees repeatedly about this very thing. Jesus freed us from this. What's wrong with going out on Sundays to eat? Or, I didn't have any other day off, so I needed to go grocery shopping. Or, watching sports on Sunday helps me relax. Dear listener, why is this commandment the only supposed nine non-binding commandment out of the ten? Could it be possible that this commandment is moral and still relevant for our day? Good morning and welcome to God's Resistance. God's Resistance is local in Wilkesbury in the Wyoming Valley and spreading elsewhere. If you need someone to talk to or pray with and are interested in joining a small group to help you live as a disciple of Christ, stay tuned for contact info. My name is Eric Samborski, and I want to thank you for tuning into God's Resistance, where we resist sin, self, the devil, and the world. You can hear us every Sunday at 9 a.m. on WITK, 1550 a.m. and 94.7 f.m. If you missed our radio program here, then look for the God's Resistance podcast on your favorite podcast platform and YouTube at 9 a.m. every Sunday where these are uploaded and you'll find other content on there as well. You can find us at godsresistance.com, the hub for all connections to God's Resistance, and on Facebook, Twitter, Gab, YouTube, and Rumble at God's Resistance that is spelled G-O-D-S-R-E-S-I-S-T-A-N-C-E. Make sure to like, follow, and turn on notifications for helpful spiritual content. And you can contact us at gods.resistance at gmail.com or give us a call at 570-362-7782. Now let's listen in on today's briefing. We live in a me society today. Me, me, me. What do I think? How do I feel? What makes me feel better? You can go to Barnes & Noble. I was just at a Barnes & Noble a little while ago. And you can look at the self-help book section. It takes up about five or six wall bays. Those aren't just the, the bookshelves in the middle of the store, but the very tall wall bookshelves that are around the perimeter of the store. And that the self-help books take up five to six of those wall bays. But then if you go look for the section on Christianity, there are about three sides of bookshelves that are reserved for Christianity. We have yoga practices that abound. You can go on YouTube and find tons of them and blog articles and all sorts of things to do with yoga. And I'm not just talking about the stretching. There's nothing necessarily wrong with stretching your body or doing something like that. But the, the whole philosophy behind yoga, where basically we're just absorbed with ourselves, we're not absorbed with anything else but us and feeling peaceful and feeling, you know, content and feeling this, that and the other. We are in a me, me, me society. Advertisement is the same way. It is absorbed with you, how you can be more attractive, how you can get what you want. The, the uh, first four commandments here, though, of the Ten Commandments, have to do with an allegiance that's higher than and outside of ourselves. Instead of looking in, we need to look out and up more often. And remembering the Sabbath, which is what we're going to be talking about here in just a little bit, was instituted by God for the refreshment of our body and the health of our soul. Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for the man. So I'm going to be looking in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Jesus spoke about the Sabbath often and dealt with that issue often with the Pharisees, but we want to go back to where we find it in the Old Testament and where it becomes law. So we read, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath unto Jehovah thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days Jehovah made heaven and earth the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, Jehovah 
blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, made it holy, made it different than all the other days. Notice that in the beginning of this, it says, remember the Sabbath, remember it. So when God spoke this law from Mount Sinai, where the giving of the law took place, when Moses went up into the mountain for 40 days, God gave him the law. He gave him also the, um, the, the blueprint for the, the temple or the tabernacle and all that was inside of it. When God spoke this law from Sinai, from Mount Sinai, he was calling his people, the Hebrews, the Israelites, to remember the Sabbath. Doesn't that seem strange? God is asking them to remember, but you think, when I look here and I, I, I read inside of the scripture, this is the first time he commanded it. But when we think about remembering, we can go all the way back to the beginning. This means that the Sabbath was not something that was just newly brought up when God gave the law on Mount Sinai, but it was something that was instituted before the law of Moses. And we read that in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. We're told that God worked six days and on the seventh he rested. So he is literally saying, remember what I did. Remember the Sabbath from the beginning. So there is a rest. I think that no matter where you stand, no matter what denomination you may be a part of, if you're a part of any, or if you're just somebody that's off the street, and somebody that doesn't have much of a church background, I think no matter where we stand, you can look at this and say, it's pretty evident that God commands a rest, and it is to be one of the seven days of the week. There's a lot of disagreements as to when that should take place, but I think that all of us, if we're honest and we just look at it at face value, we could say, God commands that there should be one day out of seven that we should rest. I think that we can start there on that ground. Many ancient writers bear testimony to the existence and observance of the Sabbath in various nations. So it wasn't just the Hebrews or the Israelites. This was a more widespread and known thing throughout the world. A few um, only are, uh, I'm going to give you a list from this man, Humphrey. He wrote about the Sabbath, and he listed off some of these different people. Homer, uh, I think all of us, uh, most of us, should be familiar with that name, or at least have heard it, the, the Odyssey or the Iliad. He wrote those. And Hesiod, and that was a guy who was contemporary um, with Homer, he was a Greek poet, they both spoke of the seventh day as holy in their writings. They weren't Christians. They weren't Hebrews. Porphyr was a philosopher who was against Christianity <clears throat> Excuse me. in 305 AD. He said that the Phoenicians consecrated one day and seven as holy. Once again, not Hebrews, not God's people but some other nations. Philo, he was a Greek philosopher, joins, uh, and he joined Judaism and Hellenism, the Greek world and the Jewish world. He says, the Sabbath is not a festival peculiar to any one people or country, but is common to all the world, and that it may be named the general and public feast or the feast of the nativity of the world. That is, it is a celebration of the world's birthday. That's how this Greek philosopher even brought it. Josephus, he was a Jewish historian uh, way back. He says that there is no city either of Greeks or barbarians, because the Greeks would have been the civilized world and barbarians, they would have said, were the people that, you know, maybe didn't have as much um, technology as the Greeks had put their minds together and built their cities and such. So, no city either of Greeks or barbarians or any other nation where the religion of the Sabbath is not known. That is him saying that from empirical evidence. He has observed it himself. Lempidius, he tells us that Alexander Severus, the Roman emperor, usually went on the seventh day into the temple of the gods there to offer sacrifice to the gods. Here we find, again, a Roman emperor is recognizing a one in seven. Grotius, he was an Arminian theologian. He developed the governmental theory of atonement. He says that the memory of the creation being performed in seven days was preserved 
not only among the Greeks and Italians, but among the Celts and Indians, that is of India, all of whom divided their time into weeks. So from time immemorial, time was divided into seven-day weeks, uh, seven-day weeks. And we find that not only just with Hebrews, but we find it, as Grotius mentioned, Greeks, Italians, Celts, Indians, so many different others. Humphrey, uh, who was the president of Amherst College, he said, the same is affirmed of the Assyrians, Egyptians, Romans, Gauls, which I think would be France, Britons, B-R-I-T-O-N-S, and Germans. So they did it also. Where did all this knowledge come from? If this is just some kind of religious, you know, uh, duty that we're supposed to do, and, you know, they just kind of put us in the straitjacket, so now this is American culture from when we were colonized from the English, uh, you know, this is supposed to be um, just kind of a religious observance. Well, if that's the case, why is it that there are all these nations all over the world that observed a Sabbath? and somehow associated it with the divine. Uh, These facts show, as Charles Finney says, that the Sabbath was not a Jewish institution, but was known and acknowledged by various nations. This proves another point, that that the conscience that we have, the understanding of morality that we have, does not come solely from upbringing and teaching, but is written on the law of our heart, is written on the flesh of our hearts. People instinctively know and understand these things, all sorts of different nationalities, ethnicities, over all times knew that there was this one day out of seven that they needed to rest in. That is the stamp of God's own law and hand upon the hearts of individuals. We're told that Jesus lights every man that comes into the world. That's not just every American or every European or every Western world person, but that's every person. Every person that exists, that has come into existence, has the light of Jesus Christ lightening their conscience, helping them to know right and wrong in the most basic form, basic form really too, of morality. And morality, part of it is this day of rest one out of seven days. It's astounding when you look at it that way, because in our culture, and especially even in the American church world, and it wasn't too long ago that all denominations across the board believed this, but the devil has succeeded in coming in and taking that Sabbath rest, that Sabbath day, that one in seven out where we rest and we worship God and put all the other cares behind, the devil has succeeded in, in attacking with full-on assault, and look at where we are as an American culture and as a Western culture. We're in bad shape morally and in so many other ways, and is it any wonder? We're told, okay, so there's this one in seven days. We've established that it wasn't just Jewish, but it was throughout all the known world that people had practiced this, many different ethnicities, nationalities, and all of that. They They were somehow observing this one in seven and thinking that it was sacred. We're told that what we're supposed to do, we're to remember the Sabbath because God rested. Then we see that nations were doing the same thing. Then he says, keep it holy. And I just want to talk to you men and fathers for just a, just a quick moment. This is addressed at large to you. You are supposed to be the one that shoulders the responsibility of leading your family in the ways of right. In, in, in how to live like people, productive people in society. You men, this lays on your shoulders. You are to then keep this day holy. Set it apart. Show your family what this looks like. You're to be the, the spiritual priest of your home. You are to help your family to walk with God. You are to shelter and protect them from evil. You are to teach them how to walk with God. And part of that is this one in seven this Sabbath day, to keep holy. That doesn't mean that wives have no responsibility, but at large, wives, they they want somebody who's a leader, somebody who's strong in their lives, that gives a covering of protection over them. Our society has made it a shame, but it's not a shame in God's sight. It's not a shame to be a godly woman, and it's not a shame to be a godly man. So, father or husband, you lead the way. Show, Show us how to keep this day holy. So, we do that first by a worshipful and devotional frame of mind, 
uh, and our heart. And it's a means of grace towards the end. So that day is set apart so that we can spend more time in worship, in a devotional frame of mind, trying to keep the health of our soul going up and and not just deflating and becoming an empty balloon, but a lively soul that walks with God. In case you've just tuned in, You are listening to God's Resistance, where we resist sin, self, the world, and the devil. You can hear us every Sunday at 9 a.m. on WITK, 1550 a.m. and 94.7 FM. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at God's Resistance. That is G-O-D-S-R-E-S-I-S-T-A-N-C-E. You can also email us at gods.resistance at gmail.com or call us at 570-362-7782. Well, not only is that one in seven days supposed to be to cultivate the health of our soul and maintain the health of our soul by worship, a devotional frame of mind and heart, using that day as a means of grace to us. Also, the way we keep it holy is by abstaining from all the labors of the week whether it's physical or mental. So we, we make efforts to, to not to think or talk about those things that are reserved for the other six days. We're kind of pushing those aside. It's like a vacation for us to just throw off those necessary things of work and life and focus more on just spiritual things and the rest of our body, you know, giving our bodies rest. So um, another thing is, not buying or selling, and you say, oh, that sounds legalistic. Hold on with me for a moment. Let's look in in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah 10.31, it says, and if the people of the land bring wear or any victuals, that's things to buy, on the Sabbath day to sell, that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath or on the holy day, and that we would leave the seventh year in the exaction of every debt. So they had special feast years and all that, But he specifically mentions that Sabbath day, the one in seven. If they come here to sell things to us, the people of God, we will not buy it. That was one thing Nehemiah said. So we understand a a base principle here. Also, Nehemiah says in uh, chapter 13 and let's see, verses 15 through 19. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath. So they were working and bringing in sheaves and lading asses, putting things on the backs of donkeys. They were working as also wine, grapes and figs and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath, And some of my servants set I at the gates, and there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. Nehemiah made a big deal out of it. Why? Because when God's day was forgotten, Israel and Judah, they turned to idolatry. They didn't keep the Sabbath. They didn't remember the Sabbath like God had instructed them. And they turned going into idolatry and turning their backs on God, and they became the most wicked and depraved people. And then they were... Uh, invaded by the Babylonians and taken captive by them for 70 years because of their forsaking God and turning their back on him. Why do we think that that principle is any different today in Western culture, in American culture? How is it that we've become far more spiritual than the people that were back in those days, in the days of Israel? Why is it that we're so much the more spiritual that we don't need a one in seven days to keep our eyes looking unto Jesus, to keep our heart looking unto God, and to make sure that other things don't crowd in on that day so that I can take full advantage of this blessing? And that's really what it is. The Sabbath is a blessing that God has given to us. Why is it any different? You would say, well, 
you know, I'm I'm busy. I, I work six days a week. When do I have time to go grocery shopping? So I'm going to go grocery shopping. I remember when I was first saved, God started dealing with me about this, about the Sabbath day, about Sunday. And I determined that I'm not going to buy. I'm not going to sell. I'm not going to work. I'll work, as har- I'll work hard throughout all the week, those six days. But that one day, I'm not going to do it. And I'm not going to buy things. And I'm not saying that emergencies or things can't happen, acts of mercy where you know, your your car breaks down and you got to fix your car or there's some medical emergency and you've got to get some kind of medicine. You got to go to the hospital. There are jobs, policemen, uh, ambulance drivers, nurses, doctors, and they're they're firemen. There's there's probably more than I can think of off the top of my head, which God is not talking about these. These are necessary things of life. This is the safety of society. This is just acts of mercy in general. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about the normal things of everyday life that we normally would have to do to push those aside. So you say, well, I I need to go grocery shopping and all. Well, God dealt with me about that. And I remember my parents at that time, they were Christians, but my mom used that same um, statement. She said, well, I have been um, buying in, uh, or, you know, I've been working all week and I haven't had time to go grocery shopping. So we're going after. Now, this may sound extreme to some of you, but I felt like I needed to do this. I said, uh, when I found out that that had happened, I ended up not eating and I bought a, a loaf of bread and peanut butter and I ate that for the rest of the week. And I, it, it did not go well. <laughs> my father was not very pleased with my decision. But I said, this is, this is what it says inside of the Bible and I'm going to obey the Lord. And you know, the Lord started to show my parents uh, this very same truth. And they had seen that and stopped doing those things, and it became a conviction to them just the same. And I'm not saying that in boastful. I just mean to say that the Lord blessed when I stood and said, no, I can't do that. So how do we buy, uh, or, or you're not to buy? Well, it makes sense, you know, don't go into stores and whatever, but we're in such a technological age. We got to be careful also. We shouldn't be buying uh, on Sunday, the Lord's Day. We shouldn't be buying on that Christian Sabbath um, anything on the internet. So we got to be careful there. We do not want to buy things because when we do, we're feeding, first of all, into this materialistic age that basically people just live for nine to five and to buy things and to make more money and to work, 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 work. We don't want to feed into that. And furthermore, we don't want to put our stamp of approval on those that are working on the Lord's Day when they themselves should be taking care to to cultivate their soul and maintain their soul and, and seek after God. And you may say, well, I don't care. I don't care about God at all. Well, that may be so, but it doesn't change the fact that this is a moral issue. And God looks at it and will hold all of us responsible for what we do if we are going to seek after God or not. And so I, as a Christian, I don't want to cause somebody else to work on that day. If all the stores were shut, what do you think people would do on that day? If internet even was closed down and you couldn't buy or sell on internet, what would people be doing? I have, a, I have a feeling that many more people would be going to church, but because of what's going on in our country, many people are distracted with so many other things. So we don't want to go somewhere to a store and basically say it's okay for the employees here to work on a day that God said they should rest and worship. Um, we also need to be careful to not make extra rules like the Pharisees so that we can keep the Sabbath better. It's very simple. Rest, don't buy or sell, don't work, worship. Those are the principles that are in the Old Testament, and the Pharisees took this and went above and beyond. A good resource for you to read is um, Edersheim's, I think it was The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. There's an appendix in the end of that book, the three-volume set, and I think you can find it online for free even through Google Books. And he talks about the crazy excesses that the Pharisees made, how much your sandals could weigh before it became work, um, that they tied cords between houses because they didn't want to do unnecessary travel uh, on the, the Lord's day or on the Sabbath day. So they tied cords and that made them one dwelling. Or they, they had a rule that they called the Sabbath day's journey. This is as far as you can go in a Sabbath day. And so what they would do the day before that was they would go out and bury some piece of their belonging. And it was like when they would go out and unbury this piece of, of, of their belonging, which was a Sabbath day's journey away, then it pressed the reset button so they could go another Sabbath day. So they meticulously planned out these foolish things. And this is what Jesus had a problem with. He didn't have a problem with saying, rest, don't work, don't buy or sell, worship. 
He had no problem with that. That's what he was hoping was going to happen, that they had a heart to want to worship God and leave these other things alone for this day. But they had taken it into such excess, and we need to be careful there too. Um, you know, we need to be careful about just anything. And I don't, I don't want to delineate it too much, but if we don't really need to be traveling on, on a Sunday, we should park it so that we're somewhere where we can worship and we can be with other believers and we don't get our, our attention distracted and diverted. Um, we read about the spices for Jesus' body when he was um, taken off the cross. They were prepared on the preparation day, which would have been the day before the Sabbath. And so some things needed to be done um, before the day of the Sabbath day, and some things needed to wait until after, as we see there with Jesus' body being prepared for burial. And so it is with us today. Some things you and I, we need to do on Saturday before the Lord's day on Sunday, and some things just need to wait till Monday. And you know what? It's really not going to kill you if we wait for certain things. When we really sit down and think about it, there's not as many emergencies as we make up in our minds and hearts. The most important thing for us to do is to feed our souls. So why do we need to heed this command? God said that he worked six days and then he rested. 31.17 of Exodus, it says, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So God did it, and he said to do it. It's also personal refreshing for both body and soul. Take a nap. Rest your body. You worked all week. Get religious instruction. Get your heart warm spiritually. We are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves as the manner of some is, it says in Hebrews. And this is woven into the very fabric of creation. Six days creation, seventh day rest. The Christian is to take his Sabbath on Sunday. There are others that would argue up and down that it still needs to be Saturday, but I'm going to give you some reasons why I don't believe that's the case. The inspired apostles changed this in commemoration of the resurrection of Jesus. John says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, worshiping him. He says, take your collections so that when I come by on the Lord's day, I can take those collections and bring them to the Jerusalem church. We already see they made that a habit. The church fathers kept Sunday, that is after the apostles, they kept Sunday as the Christian Sabbath. And the general church led by the Holy Ghost over all the ages has observed Sunday as, and God's blessing has attended it. Don't be deceived and get all tied up in some other crazy thing where we need to keep doing it on Saturday. It is the Christian Sabbath commemorating the Lord's rising from the dead. And so we need to keep that Sabbath even today, and it's still relevant even in a day where people try and make us think that it's not. So do you remember, listener, the Sabbath day and keep it holy? Do you make this a vital practice of your life, of your everyday life, of your weekly life? Do you go out shopping on Sundays because you couldn't do it the other six days? I think that we have much more time than we think we do. We can be on Facebook for extended periods of time, but yet we have no time for the most important things. Do you work on Sundays? Can't you just push that aside? Are you not attending church on Sunday and instead doing your own desires? If you are guilty here, then you've broken one of God's Ten Commandments. Being guilty, you've sinned and you need to repent. If you have not been born again, then you need to repent wholesale of all your sins and because you're headed for hell. But God has put Jesus as a substitute for us. If you repent and believe on his name, there is still hope for you. Your next step is to call 570-362-7782 or email gods.resistance at gmail.com. I want you to introduce yourself to me. I want you to set up a time so that we can meet. I want to coach and help you further to walk with God. Make sure to like and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all our social media accounts. You're going to find more teaching preaching to help you on your journey. You can then connect also with others that are going through their journeys. And then I want you to tell your friends about this broadcast every Sunday at 9 a.m. and our social media accounts. But above all, join the resistance, God's resistance. A 
Special thank you to Spectacular Sound Productions for giving permission for the use of the song Heroes and Monsters, which was edited and used in part on this production. The permission was granted under Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International Creative Commons license. That license may be found at https colon forward slash forward slash creative commons dot org forward slash licenses forward slash by hyphen essay forward slash 4.0 forward slash legal code.